Hi everyone, uh, today is the next update on my 1955 Nomad project. I think this is number four, uh, the last one was number three, so we're just gonna keep going. So, we are on air now. I just got that for my birthday. My daughter picked that for somebody that she considered a very amateur YouTube uh, person. And that's definitely me. Uh, we're going to start today looking at the tail guy, which as you can see is on the car right now. Basically, I've had this thing together and apart two or three times and everything seems to be working on it. Right now, you can see the key slot is in the horizontal position. Basically, there's a plunger for that thing, which is rectangular. And then the bell crank mechanism, which is inside the door right there, has a rectangular hole in it. And when the key slot is in the horizontal position, it's 90 degrees from the rectangular hole on the bell crank. And when you push it, it takes the arms of the bell crank, it pulls them together like that, pulls the rod in from either side and unlatches the latches. So here, push this in, you can hear the latches and the gates open. The mechanism is underneath that very rusty chrome cover. Those are the latches on the side, both sides. So. This is the dovetail. When the lift gate is in the down position, you close the tailgate and the dovetail lines up the two pieces and you can close the uh, tailgate then. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. You can hear the latches latch, pull that out. Right now I don't have these small brackets bolted to the side of the tailgate. And I think, I think they're bent, but these things have a little rubber bumper on them. And when those are on the tailgate door, there's adjustable in and out. So you can set the door. So it lines up with the outside of the quarter panels. So anyway, that thing's working now. Uh, if, the tailgate was locked, meaning the key and the latch slot is in the vertical position. That rectangular plunger would line up with the rectangular hole in the bell crank. And when you push the button, it would just push right through and you couldn't unlock it out. So anyway, here are the latches. So that's all good to go. All right, now, in the last video, I was uh, going through the orange colors and everything. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all that, but um, I had to make a trip out to California. And before I did, I took these inner fenders and the inner fender ex lower extensions out to a place that does uh, paint stripping. And I had them dipped and took all the undercoating and all the paint off so that I could understand exactly what might be involved in getting these things uh, repaired. Those of you that are working on these cars and you buying or buying big parts and having them shipped, the doggone shipping is just outrageous now. Um, inner fenders, I think are like 150 bucks. Uh, if you buy them from the place out in California, the shipping is $325. So it's cost twice as much to ship it as it is to buy it. So uh, basically if I bought new inner fenders, I'd have, you know, I don't know, 500 to $750 invo involved in the purchase. And then it'd be a reproduction part and it probably wouldn't fit anyway. So I think I'm gonna have these repaired. Uh, these were original to the car. And because I had never seen the inner fenders assembled with an outer fender, 
what I did was I collected all those pieces. This is the driver's side inner fender, outer fender, lower fender extension, and the filler panel that bolts to the radiator core support. Also, the brackets that attach the fender to the bumper and the little piece that closes in in the front and helps hold that lower light in place. Um, one of the things that I did to help with this project, I bought a basically a bolt kit. And you can see it has all of the original fasteners and clips and stuff to put these things back together, including all the ones with the correct head marking, all those there, the different bolts. This was like a lag bolt and these are regular flange, flange head bolts to do that as long as instructions. So for those of us, when it's our first try five project, this was a big help. So anyway, I got the finger put together. I see now where some rust repair is gonna be needed. This whole piece is missing and also missing on this thing as well. All right, so, so I had to take the front clip off and that's, that's what I did there. And then taking the front clip off, I also put further thought into my radiator core support. And one of the things that I noticed about this before was it, it was bent. Uh, not only was it bent, but on each side, right there, and in exactly the same spot on the other side, it had been cut. Uh, I was looking for repair pieces or replacement pieces to fix this thing, and I got connected with a Tri-5 chat group, and what everybody was talking about was uh, it was hard to get the V8 engines out of these cars and so what a lot of people did is they just cut this bar out. And again, this car had traction bars on it, so I don't know if it spent time at the drag strip. If it did, it might have meant that the engine was in and out, in and out, in and out often on this car, as it is with some, some of the drag cars. So I think what happened with this thing, maybe when the first uh, original 265 engine they were trying to pull that out and the radiator would not have been in place. They brought it forward, it hit this crossbar and that's what bent it from the backside. And in their frustration, and we all know the feeling, we just want to get the engine out. So they cooked their hacksaw and whacked that off knowing that uh, they could just weld it back together. And you can see this was like brass, brass rod welding here on both sides, so that was done a long time ago. So I think that's what happened with the car. Uh, I was happy with that explanation anyway, or I was satisfied with it. But in taking the front clip apart, I got to thinking a little bit more about my car. Let's take a look at the bottom side here. I don't think I showed this in detail before. That's the traction bar that's on the car, that thing goes back there and attaches. But the other thing that I noticed when I got the car was that these reinforcement plates had been added to the frame. And I added this mark, there's an edge there. And then you can see the edge on the bottom. This piece goes from here to just in front of the front leaf spring bracket. And this piece here wraps all the way underneath and attaches back there. And then there's another piece back there. Oops. You can see that. All right. Same on both sides. Whoever patched it did a nice job. That stuff is a quarter inch thick. So it's heavy duty stuff. So I think that there was two possibilities there. One, Maybe the person that added the traction bars wanted to stiffen up the frame, so he welded on these 
reinforcement plates. That's one option. The other option was this frame was really, really rusty. And they understood that unless they patched it, the whole thing was going to fall apart the first time they did a burnout. So uh, there's maybe two options here, and I'm still not completely sure which is which. Again, this car didn't come with the original 265 or whatever engine replaced it. So we're never going to know the full story about the traction bars in its days as a hot rod. But now onto the front of the car. I had proclaimed loudly in episode number three that all of the sheet metal and the hood and all of that stuff was original to the car and that the car had never been wrecked and that uh, because there wasn't any trim holes in the fenders or the doors, but that's, that's a kind of a different longer discussion, uh, that this car was ordered in a special color, this orange, that's everywhere on this thing. And then also didn't come with the eyebrow trim that everybody knows about for the 55s. Uh, in the process of getting the front clip all the way out of the fenders and radiator core support and all that stuff out of the way and I started stripping off the brake lines and stuff like that, uh, to look at it, this frame and look at this, that little hump is not supposed to be there. And when you look over here, uh, a very deep bump there. And so this thing must have gotten pushed over this way and then pop that up here. And then on this side over here, you can see that that thing is bent on both the top and bottom. So I have to retract my previous statement about no accident. This car clearly had had some front end damage at one time. Um, not gonna be, know what the deal was, but um, I'm not a hardcore Tri-5 guy. So like right now at this point, I can't tell you, are those definitely GM fenders? Or are those really old reproduction stuff? I don't know when reproduction fenders showed up. Same with the hood. Uh, not sure when that stuff showed up. So that's something that I'm thinking about. Now I put a feeler out, uh, a couple friends checking to see if there's maybe a nicer Tri-5 somewhere frame in the area and it looks like there might be a, a guy a guy that has a couple frames and so i'm waiting for a call back from him so rather than trying to fix this frame again the bent front frame horns both sides and now all the issues back at the kick up in the frame i'm not sure this thing is necessarily worth fixing so uh, if i can pick up a nice straight frame I uh, probably will go that route. Um, it's a, uh, I'd rather find an original frame. This is not a restoration, but I did a quick check of the web and like brand new, brand new, newly fabricated frames are like $4,000. And if you buy a complete new chassis, meaning frame, suspension, steering gear, and everything like that, Fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars, and the budget on this car just will not withstand it. I mean, I need to find like a five hundred dollar or seven hundred and fifty dollar frame that's nice and straight that just needs sandblasted and painted, so I can rob all the suspension stuff off this, put this back. So that is where I am with the car. Um, a little disappointing about the frame, but that's old cars. What are you gonna do? Happy that tailgate works. We talked about the inner fenders. I think that's pretty much it. So uh, the next step will to be finish getting the rest of the stuff out from underneath the dash. And then a little bit 
more. I got to clean the grease and stuff off this thing so maybe that can get sandblasted. And then hopefully it'll have a new frame. So in the next update, whenever that thing happens, uh, we will know more about the frame and whether or not this one is going to get fixed or I'm going to replace it. Still can't believe the patch job on the quarter panels. Wow. This is some nasty stuff. Quarter panels are $2,000 a pair. So people that have done Nomads, there's no point in belly aching about it. Uh, you know that getting into them. So I'm trying to control the money on this thing and we'll have to see what happens. So as always, uh, like, share, comment, uh, subscribe if the content is interesting. I got the Nomad, I got my motorcycles, I do a little woodworking. I'm all over the place on this stuff. And so uh, any questions, certainly let me know. Uh, and we'll keep these things uh, moving forward uh, when I get some more progress made. Thanks everybody, have a nice day.